Good afternoon. Welcome to the Stuckman Graphic Design Lecture Series. My name is Phil Chu, the Head of Graphic Design at Penn State University. We are so excited to have you all for a special lecture by Georgia Lupi today. She'll be talking about human side of data. Data visualization is one of the new area of study at Penn State Graphic Design. We successfully launched a new online course entitled Visual Information Design last fall. It became a very popular course in the university. Currently, we are developing a second course entitled Humanizing Data Temporarily because we recognized data can provide us with more, something more than number or efficiency. We want to help our students to use data to become more human instead of using data only to be, become efficient. That is why we invite Josia to hear her story and learn more about it. Thank you, Emily, for connecting us with Josia. From here, an assistant professor of graphic design, Emily Burns, take the floors. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to, uh, to uh, introduce Georgia. So just a quick anecdote. I first encountered Georgia's work a number of years ago by accident in, in rather dramatic fashion as I walked through the streets of downtown Manhattan in 2015 and walked by the most packed exhibition opening I have ever seen with people bursting out of the, uh, the storefront for art and architecture uh, for the exhibition measure. And having to know what the fuss was about, I went in and I was totally blown away by one project in particular, which was Georgia's Dear Data collaboration with Stephanie Pasavic. And I had never seen anything like it. And I was so struck by that work, which is like all of Georgia's work. It's mind bending, beautiful, totally unique. And years later, I was lucky enough to get to meet Georgia in person. And I am just so thrilled that she is here today to share her work with us. And with that, I'd like to introduce Georgia Lupi. Georgia is an information designer and currently a partner at Pentagram. Before joining Pentagram, Lupi co-founded Akarat, an acclaimed data-driven research design and innovation firm with offices in Milan and New York. In her role, she built rich, visually driven experiences around data for clients such as IBM, Google, Starbucks, United Nations, World Health Organization, and the M Museum of Modern Art, Gucci, Valentino, Target, JP Morgan Chase, Popular Science and Wired Magazine, and the list goes on and on and on. So I encourage you to read her full bio in the email that was sent out for many more uh, incredible accomplishments. And with that, I would like to uh, let Georgia take the floor. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, everybody, for having me. This is really, really exciting. I mean, obviously, I would have loved to be there in person, but, you know, this is how we do it now. So I'm thrilled to be here. Happy Friday. Thank you for joining. Um, I'll be sharing my screen in a second, and I'll just turn off my video as I'm sharing the presentation, but then, you know, I'll be back. Um, I guess, you know, I'm really excited about the conversation that we will have after my talk. I will talk about my work, um, and I really just hope that these for you all can be inspiring so just be open be inspired uh you will see many images many many data images and you know i'm uh, looking forward to our conversation so i'm gonna go ahead and stop my video and share my screen can i just have a confirmation that everybody sees my keynote I don't hear anything, so maybe if somebody just tell me, yes, everything That's is okay. Good. Okay, thank you so much. All right, uh, so my name is Georgia and I am an information designer. Um, and that means that every day with my team, um, I shape and design the different ways that my clients and their clients access different kind of information. And particularly in my case, data. Uh, but data that can be qualitative and quantitative, big and small, and data that organizations already have, or actually most of the time crafted by myself and my team in collaboration with our clients and data that then we represent visually translating numbers into images through data visualizations and through building interactive experiences with these visualizations. Um, so as you can start seeing, my work is particular and visually driven. Um, and to give you a sense, I will play a montage of the work we did in the past years with Accurate, again, as Emily was introducing the company that I co-founded. Um, and in the images that you will be seeing up 
obviously every color, size, position, and animation of the elements are direct representations of data point. projects um, like from a data-driven perspective and a design perspective but before doing that I, I would like to give you again a broader idea of the type of project you can work on um, as a designer with a data focus so for example and again then I will explain a few uh, more in, in detail so in the past year we spent from working with newspapers and magazine these that you're seeing here is a very early collaboration with the Sunday cultural supplement of Corriere della Sera, which is the main Italian newspaper. Uh, well, I'm Italian. I moved to New York 10 years ago. Uh, we're from 2012 to 2014. So that was kind of like a, lot, a little bit of the beginning of the data visualization scene in public. Um, from 2012 to 2014, we designed more than 40 data analysis and visualizations that are the one that you're seeing. But again, probably not the visualizations that you would expect on a national newspaper. So every week we looked for data in topic, uh, really combining and overlaying different information on cultural and social phenomena with many layers of context that we visualized with a unique visual language created and crafted specifically for the data stories we found, as you can see. So these are not bar chart, pie charts, and actually standard charts that you can just pick out of a library of possibilities. We really every time crafted a new visual language and created a legend, as you can see in all of these, for the readers who actually could take their time uh, to parse and understand what was in this visualization. So editorial data visualization of this kind. Um, but then, for example, completely different type of projects. Um, in 2017, we worked with IBM, where in this case, we designed a system of guidelines for all of their data products, their data visualization. So, First of all, you can see here guidelines on how to work with data visualization effectively on a daily basis. So, you know, the do's and don'ts, the how to pick a chart, the mistakes, um, and, you know, the axes and background categorizations. But most importantly, also guidelines that could translate the great design heritage that a company like IBM has built over the years into how they work with data. So guidelines that will make their chart look in IBM, uh, taking a clear inspiration, visual inspiration from the materials from IBM from the past, and even venturing into looking at physical objects as part of the IBM tradition that could be translated into data visualization concepts. So you see in this case, much more like of a meta project where we acted as a um, consultant that will help them then implement visualizations that have this particular style that we designed. Um, completely different type of experiences. You can also work with data 
uh, creating environmental experiences, so in the physical space. And this is a project that we did for the Milan Triennale, the triennial that was called Broken Nature at the Design Museum in Milan um, a year and a half ago. So here we created a data wallpaper, like a data tapestry for this room that we called the Room of Change. And it is a, a data tapestry that flowing on and to right illustrates how multiple aspects of our environment are uh, decided together with the curator have changed in the past centuries, how they'll still, how they likely continue changing. Um, so this was the sketch to give you an idea, in this case, through a number of global data sets on nature, society, technology, science, but also single and specific contextual stories, such as the disappearing of the Lake Oral because of climate change. And this is a really dense data environment when the implementation and the increasing of value over time has been repeated in these vertical instances to really, at a glance, give the sense that things actually change only if you look uh, from far away, but closely, day after day, they might not necessarily look like they're changing that was the concept that we um actually delivered through data and as always with the legend on the center to invite visitors to discover this world of change um and you know to create again just to open up your minds of what you can do in terms of data to create even more physical installations with data this is the recent starbucks um research roastery that opened in milan italy again one year ago uh, where we designed a data visualization carved and etched in this big brass wall which is actually the one that you saw to the left this is a uh, horizontal drawing that could give you the sense of the layers that are in here it's different carving techniques, perforation and lightning to represent different data points depicting the timeline of the history of the brand Starbucks, the coffee making process and the places in the world that have been fundamental for Starbucks history. So here you see in this case, we don't even use drawings and colors and graphic elements, but we are etching um, and perforating and using lightning to actually have this data come to life. And once more, just to open up the idea, in this case, a wall that can also be experienced through an augmented reality mobile app um, that we designed and developed that actually brings this data to life. So in this case, adding a digital layer that interacts directly with the physical space of the wall and where this wall that is static can be turned into a living artwork with uh, access to many data-driven extra content and also with data that can be uh, updated over time. So again, this can even be an entry point to much, I would say, data-driven explorations. Uh, and I want to share one last piece of context on where I am in this moment, again, before digging into a few specific ideas that I want to share through projects. So two years ago, I will be... Uh, um, uh, two years ago in June, I joined Pentagram, which is the biggest um, independent design firm in the world as a partner in their New York office. Um, we are 25 partners globally. This is a buzz in our global gathering before the pandemic. And um, uh, Pentagram has offices in London, Berlin, and Austin, as well as New York. And I was their ninth partner in New York. And so Pentagram is an incredibly exciting space for me. I believe that my partners way before I joined have significantly contributed in shaping our collective visual cultures for the past almost 50 years, forming our relationship with brands, products, and with our built environment through brand identity projects, through signage and wayfinding, environmental graphic, really branding visually many of the iconic places that we walk by every day, and ultimately visually shaping a piece of our relationship with society as well, if you think about it. And so joining Pentagram for me means to further my practice and try to integrate the language of data into even more mundane experiences, into what we see, what we consume, and even where. Um, because let's start here. So what is data? So for many of us, data feels not so con real life and it might even have a nebulous meaning, often only associated with numbers, techniques, algorithms, and often seen as scary and complicated, you know, mostly cold and inhuman, just overwhelming. 
But um, as you know, Phil and Emily were introducing in the beginning, there's another approach to what we so coldly call data that has always interested me more. That is to always remember that data is an abstracted representation of our reality. And, and for this reason, therefore, a lens and a filter that we can use to see our world through every, any aspect of our world, and especially our human nature and our society, one subject at a time. And then a narrative design, creative material to design experiences on, because it's only through seeing these data represented visually that our human brain can actually grasp them and understand them. And uh, finally, I think that in all this process of humanizing data and making it, um, I would say, accessible and, and, and into human stories, what I think is more interesting often is the data that we don't see the data that's ready in the form of a spreadsheet, but they are the most interesting ones that can really unlock the potential of data to tell human and relatable stories if they are made visible. And uh, you will see what I mean after this long intro. Let's get started with uh, Projects Projects. So, this is this a radical experiment where no technology was involved. Actually, the project that Emily described as the first one that she encountered about my work, it's a, it was a self-initiated project, meaning no clients, uh, really a, a self-initiated exploration that after years of working pretty much only on digital experiences um, and with quote unquote big data, really reconnected of data. Uh, it's called Dear Data and it is a collaboration with Stephanie Pozovic. She's a London-based information designer that shares a lot of common approaches to the world of data with me. And Stephanie and I met only twice in our lives when we decided to run this strange experiment around one main question. Is it possible to get to know another human being through data only? So for Dear Data, every week and for one year, we use our personal data to get to know each other. So personal data around weekly shared mundane topics from our thoughts and ideas to our most intimate feelings, from our belonging to our apologies and laughter. So if you think about it, 52 excuses pretexts in form of data to investigate and reveal a particular aspects of ourselves and about our days. Uh, well, the fun aspect was that these are data that we would manually then hand draw on a postcard sized sheet of paper that every week was sent from London to New York where I, and from New York to London and Stephanie leaves for one year. The front was always the data drawing and the back of the postcard contained the address of the other person and the legend, so how to read our drawings. So Stephanie and I collected our data manually to force us to focus on the nuances that computers and devices cannot gather, um, really also using data to explore our minds and not only our activities, getting insights on the context of the activities that we were recording and not only on the numbers. That is really what I think is interesting about the whole Dear Data project. So for example, at week number three, uh, three weeks in, we tracked the thank yous that we said and received. So who they were for and from, what they were about, it was a, if it was a really meant thank you or not. So really all of these little contexts that make the quantification of the thank you much more personal and they made them really representative of me and Stephanie has people. And in this example, for example, I always say that by looking at my week through the lens of this particular layer, I realized that I thanked mostly the people that I didn't know well. You see a long list of thank you uh, close to acquaintances and waiters and waitresses, apparently. Uh, but really, I kind of didn't thank enough the people who were close to me. And when I saw it collected, it really jumped at me. And so we started to look, we started to look at our days through data, such as in this case where I mapped my complaints, um, borrowing literal visual inspiration from the music notation system, really to show the repetitiveness of my complaints over time. And here you can even start seeing design wise how you can use some sort of like metaphors about the very content to personalize your data design. But even here, again, not only quantifying the number of times that I complained, but adding context and details about why, what was happening, what was the situation and the feeling, was it an admissible complaint or should have, you know, probably decided to talk out loud about it. 
And so, you know, real, we have been realizing week after week how to put ourselves in these numbers. And, the, and we have been realizing the importance of adding context and quantitative aspects to make this data truly representative of ourselves. And this is really true for any kind of data. Uh, so I'd like for you to think about this project that is very personal, very artistic as a kind of like a backbone to think about every type of data this way to make them meaningful. Uh, well, yeah, so over 52 weeks, we mapped our envies and what the feelings triggered in us. We mapped our desires, what they told us, our emotions and decisions and, and many more. And if you think about it, creating intimate portraits of ourselves to share with the other person through this invisible layer and language of data. And I guess that you start seeing what I mean by the data we don't see. In this case, I think data that are much more interesting than what we usually associate with personal data collection, such as what you're seeing here, numbers of steps, expenses, patterns, calories intake. You know, I think that all of us probably have seen these charts and these uh, values on our phones. But, and this is amazing, don't get me wrong, but I just think that as designers, there's more to that that we can explore. For small and big data is true for personal data and, and, and way beyond. Um, so Dear Data also became a book that is at its third edition, being translated in different languages. And the original collection of postcards have found the most exciting home because they've been acquired um, as part of the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art, which has been quite nice. But what excites me even more and what excites Stephanie and me even more is that Dear Data has been so well received from the public outside the data community. We really have seen thousands of postcards made by people, not even designers or artists, who learned about the project and wanted to experiment on themselves. And even teachers of any grade are using this format to teach their students the world of data. So again, starting from human observation, human questions, things that we can relate to, as opposed to the data that are already there and how they should be visualized. So I think this is really, for me, a testament that if we try and get to the very nature of data, you know, there's, uh, there's a value to that um, for any kind of project. All right, so through Dear Data, we have seen that, you know, we can turn even the smallest details of our lives into data that we can look at to see things from a different perspective. But besides personal data, we can do this anywhere. And here's like opening up, um, you know, to experiences that possibly you might want to design or you might uh, want to think about um, as designers. So, well, also, I'm often asked, where do you find data? And more and more lately, I'm replying that I often design my data. So it's a, you'll see again what I mean following up with this other example. So in 2017, almost four years ago, I have had the great honor to collaborate with Paola Antonelli. She is the senior curator for design and architecture at the Museum of Modern Art and with her team on a piece that closed a show that she curated that was about fashion called Items Is Fashion Modern that has been up at MoMA for um, almost six months. So the show, which was amazing, curated by her, presented 111 items of clothing and accessories that, if you just think about it, have had a strong impact and influence on our culture. Just by reading the list of the objects, you can really understand what I mean. So from the bikini to the burkini, from the Patagonia fleece jacket to the balaclava, elements such as the Chanel number no. five, the Dr. Martins, uh, the pencil skirt, the monogram, the mini skirt um, are included here. So we're really painting through these 111 objects. I would say really our relationship with the way that fashion makes us connect with the world. And I have had the incredible opportunity to create a site specific that after Dear Data, I was really excited and wanted to do it hand-drawn. Uh, so a site-specific visualization uh, to guide the visitors after they exited the exhibition to really explore the features of these items that are represented here with the legend, both individually and as part of a bigger ecosystem. But what is interesting here is that I didn't have any data. There was no data available. I only add the list of the 111 objects and the background research that was conducted by the curatorial team on each one of the items. And so what did I do? I put on the glasses of the data collector and delved into these 111 stories. And I was looking for bits of quantitative and qualitative information that primarily helped me answer a few main questions to understand and reveal why was each one of the items included in this show. And as a visitor, what could have been interesting to explore through data? 
in the questions that I asked to this, say, background curatorial uh, material are, for example, was the item a medium or a message? So meaning, did Paola consider it iconic and worth being included because of its technical or aesthetical features or for what it represented socially? Um, and for example, if they ended up in the category, it's a message um, where they weren't to conform to a movement or to escape from the movement. So meaning as it become the object, a way to blend into a social context or to break free from it. And I asked many more of these questions in a way, with, for lack of a better word, crafting a data set from these questions where the data were absolutely not in this form before this analog process that anybody can do. You don't need to be a data scientist, a data visualization designer, or a data expert to actually inquire yourself about what is important about these 111 items and how can I make a categorization that can help me understand the big picture and the relationship between them. So I built together with the curators this data set and then each one of the items became a symbol that I drew on the wall, positioned and visualized according to this set of attributes that I built together with the curators with a legend on the left side wall to interpret it. And everything is on my website. I will not go in depth in this case, in the design and why I decided to you know, really depict things this way because my point here was to show you that the whole point of my exercise was to start from the final manifestation of this process and work backward. So really reconstruct, I would call it in layers of data that Paula and her team used as an input for the curation, even without knowing it. And then making it visible for everybody to see through the lens of data visualization. Again, something that to me was um, really valuable. And moving on, I think that in similar situations, we don't see these invisible layers of data that are there and that can be fundamental to have more um, you know, knowledge and information. First of all, because we often don't observe and collect these more qualitative and human types of data, but also because nobody carefully designed the experiences, not only the visualization, but the experiences to elevate them and to reveal them, even when they were present all along. And, you know, design, again, besides state of visualization, plays a really important role here. And um, uh, moving on again, I have a few examples that I hope uh, can, um, can make you see that uh, strongly. So before, before the uh, everything shut down for the pandemic, a few years ago, the organizers of the TED conference came to us before their last edition in Vancouver with a challenging brief. So how can we use data from the conference participants, so from the attendees, to give something valuable back to them? So initially, in our initial brainstorming, we imagined to create an installation on a big wall where we could use, for example, an algorithm to match participants with similar profiles, such as their job position, where they were from, and so on. But you know, then we asked ourselves, but ultimately, in what way would this data be meaningful? Um, so once more, we decided to look for data in less obvious places, and in this case, to look for data that could create a connection. So we created what we called data portraits of all of the people who were at TED. So these data portraits are images based on all of the people's answers to a series of questions and then translated into a unique hand-drawn data-driven image where every color, symbol, and position of the elements that you're seeing, obviously, is a direct translation of one person's answer. So this is me drawing on my iPad. There was an experience that was done in person, but also for all of the people who couldn't really just wait for me to draw, we created a software like an iPad questionnaire and a software that generates the images immediately. So these images were immediately printed on buttons that people would wear throughout the conference on top of their TED badges, and they would use these um, buttons as tools for sparking conversations and finding commonalities with others. So we asked everybody simple, but I would say evocative and somehow personal questions, as you can read on the right, starting from the very reason that you might be a TED. So which TED letter are you, technology, entertainment, or design? Um, or do you get your best ideas after an adult beverage or while at work? Uh, or questions like how messy is your desk? Or how many unread emails in your inbox before you freak out? 
And again, people at TED were wearing this abstract symbol on their badges with a legend that was always at the back of the badge to interpret, uh, you know, what actually we're seeing on other people's participants. But really, over time, they it, the, the symbols and the questions were so uh, recognizable that, you know, you didn't even uh, uh, need to read the legend anymore. So, you know, they would use uh, these badges to identify similarities and differences with other people as a first glance. I believe as an excuse to introduce themselves like a nice bracer to start a conversation that was much more meaningful than, for example, saying, oh, hello, I'm Georgia, uh, I'm an information designer, what did you do? And also really imagine an environment with people kind of like didn't know each other because it is really, um, you know, the, the, at, at TED you usually go by yourself for how expensive it is, it's not that you bring your whole family. And so really the, being able to create a connection just by seeing somebody walking uh, on the uh, outside of the main conference through this tool has proven to be, I mean, for the attendees, kind of valuable. And you see here that we have been working with soft and definitely small data that, again, in this case, I think proved to be more meaningful than anything we could have gathered digitally or automatically. Um, we replicated this idea of the data portraits because it was, you know, well received at a few other events where the information, so the questionnaire, was sent in advance in advance to the attendees, and where, of course, the again the portrait comes with the legend to always interpret it. And when graphically, in this case, you don't see the the branding of the conference, but we worked with the brand identity and graphic guidelines of the conference brands uh, to create the portraits. And, you know, still through the idea of the data portrait, we recently turned this concept into a completely interactive and collective installation that is up now at the Museum of the City of New York. It is part of a show called uh, Who We Are. Actually, you see people without masks because the show opened right before, uh, you know, March of last year, but right now it is opened back up again. Um, definitely, you will need to go with a mask. So it is the piece that we created is part of a show called Who We Are, Visualizing New York by the numbers. And it is an exhibition that was open in anticipation of last year's 2020s census that really highlights with many pieces the importance of the census. And we have been invited to create an original piece to contribute to the show. So the brief was really open. We could have, I mean, we could create pretty much whatever we wanted on the idea of identity and on the idea of counting and documenting. So we called what we did, what counts. Um, and with this piece, we sort of like question the fundamental information that are asked on the census. So what counts as two core components, a large projection on the gallery wall and an interactive iPad interface in the middle of the space. So as they walk by, visitors can answer a short questionnaire on the iPad about themselves and their identity. And so here are some of the questions. And one thing that is really important in my work and in our work is that we most of the time also work on the content. And so together with the curator, we actually uh, worked on what are these questions. Actually, we, we proposed them uh, and we vetted them with the curator that can create, um, you know, a sort of like reflection on identity. So you're seeing, for example, that these questions are if you had to pick only one, which of the following is more important to you, living by my values, earning fame or recognition, uh, as opposed to asking you where do you live only, uh, how do you define home, uh, for example, where I currently live, where I was born, uh, do you feel that what you currently have in life is enough, um, this is about the future generation, if you only had to choose one, I hope the next generation will enjoy better blank in the future that I did. So really kind of adding um, some sort of like personal information to what is that usually we count. And then, you know, as you might have guessed, a unique visual symbol is generated on the iPad as you move through the survey, also interactively making you feel and understand that your answers uh, actually change the output that you have to the right. So it is a data portrait that represents the combination of your unique answers. And once the survey is completed, as you've seen a second ago, you could physically swipe your data portrait to the gallery wall, where you will actually join these animated projections of all of the data portraits collected since the beginning. Uh, and so in this case, your portrait is contributing to dynamic graph to the dynamic graphic on the walls. And you know, the difference in terms of designing the experiences, if you think about it, is that designing for a conference where the people are there for the whole duration of the conference, and this is the actual event, we wanted to create a sense of community for the people that were there. But in here instead, because the installation will go uh, on and on for months, we wanted to create an ongoing record instead of the participants' thoughts and ideas. 
uh, and inviting us to think about how do we want to be counted and what matters the most to count about us. And, you know, uh, graphically, we intentionally designed the data portraits as hand-drawn, somehow imperfect, to contrast with the clinical charts that are typically used to visualize census data. Uh, well, then in the projection, each element is also visually unpacked and explained, so that we're also revealing the singular responses to each question. Uh, of course, there's a legend close to the projection to interpret what you're seeing. And again, because we've really learned that people like patterns to be reminded of the collective experiences um, after you leave, you could also print your unique, you can, uh, if you go there, print your unique data portrait on a button that you can take home and wear. Uh, of course, hooked to a legend. And again, this is something that I'll touch upon really also in the last project that I'm showing. But um, it's for me, the, the difference between just doing data art, which is loosely inspired by data and doing data visualization design or data design is always, always to provide people the access to the very rules that build the symbol. So access to the actual information. Um, yeah, so the installation continues to collect data throughout the months. Um, and again, in this case, I think also creating these ongoing visual records of the of the visitors. Um, and so, OK, I'm going to share one last example that is possibly the most exciting project that I've worked on. Um, it is and also, again, I, I chose these different type of examples because they're really, really different. And I really wanted to open up to you guys, for you all, the idea of how many type of outputs, projects and processes we could uh, work on from a data driven perspective if we look at the data with the right lenses. So this project is a fashion collection that I designed for um, the fashion brand called And Other Stories, uh, which is part of the H&M group. Um, it's a data driven collection that a special edition that was out in the stores in November 2019. So it's a collection where the graphic patterns that are printed, embroidered, sawed are a direct representation of, again, I think very human data points. Um, in fact, we went and I went and looked for data into the achievement on three of three unprecedented women who've been pioneers in previously male dominated field and who paved the ground for how the women to start and thrive. Uh, the three women, which I'm going to explain shortly, are Ada Lovelace, Rachel Carson, and Mae Jamison. And for the three of them, at this point, you've seen my process, I went and looked and crafted a data set about their major accomplishments. So what they did, what is that they brought to the world in their career, and then background information on their lives. And then data that I used to create the visual patterns that you see displayed in the collection. And in this case, um, the entry point is hopefully beautiful patterns that you will want to buy and wear but they also have a deep meaning behind them. And to conclude the talk, now that you have seen my approach and the role that crafting data sets and uh, plays in my work, I wanted to guide you a bit more through the process of the creation of the design so that you can see how data can inform all type of products and outcomes. So first woman, Ada Lovelace, born in 1915, and she is considered now to be the first computer programmer in history. So it was the first time that someone programmed a machine to do complex math and as a matter of fact, originating the disciplines of computer science. So in this case, I uh, sort of like transcribed what was the original structure of the algorithm that she wrote into what is at the base of our computers right now. Don't want to nerd too much in these details. Everything is explained on my website and on Pantera websites. So in this case, I sort of like analyzed and visualized the structure and the mathematical form of the algorithm that she wrote. So as I had the data in my mind, in parallel, I was looking for visual inspiration in pieces of art or images that could reflect the very nature of the data that I was working with. So geometric, mathematical, repetitive, but with variation. So this is the mood board that I built for myself. And then I started to sketch different ways in which each one of the 36 steps of the algorithm and its variables could be represented. These are again tests, having already the data in front of me, but sketching out possible features. And then also at the same time, I was starting to sketch how to display them on a piece of garment because of course, designing for a magazine, designing for an exhibition and designing for a piece of textile that one needs to wear is a completely different type of, um, it's not a completely different type of process, but requires you to really think about the output that you're creating. 
So this is the selected option with vertical elements, one for um, each of the 36 steps of ADA algorithm. And you start seeing how the repetition forms an interesting visual motif. So I think you start really seeing the differences between designing something that is for a wall, for a pin, for a postcard, for a magazine, and something that needs to become fashion in a way. Still with the same data process that starts from creating your own rules and a legend, translating the data into images. So it's one of these 36 lines of the algorithm is one of the elements, vertical elements that you see before, with internal dividers representing the variables. And again, without entering into details, of course, every symbol, color, divider, and the outside graphic um, represent a data point. So this is the final pattern for Ada. All of the steps going up and down according to the way that they're calculated one after the other. A pattern that leads onto the silhouettes that together with the in-house fashion team um, uh, of uh, another stories we designed after my ugly sketches, they sort of like really refined them pretty nicely. And then I started to also place, like started to understand how to place elements all over, or for example, only as a bold accent. Um, or more creative placement. And uh, these are the final pieces. So you see there's a pattern, there's an algorithm, there's a data visualization, but then, you know, the, the full data set is displayed on the sweater to the left. And then we got more creative with the placement of the other two. Um, well, yes, part of the process, a lot of back and forth and testing uh, to then, you know, realize that some of the colors were not possible or were, you know, were not really detectable. So again, back and forth with them, which I really enjoy. Um, enjoyed. As part of the shooting, this is also very important for the publicity, a beautiful model, uh, her name is Nikita, was posing as I recreated the legend behind her. So all of the, let's say, professional shootings and photographs and videos that they used for promoting the collection were actually deeply always rooted and based in explaining uh, customers that this collection has uh, data and stories behind it. And you know, I'll move quicker. The process got repeated for the other women. Rachel Carson, she is the first environment uh, environmental activist. And Silent Spring, her book was published in 1962, and it is the classic that really launched the environmental movement. And here I went and looked for data in the structure of the content of the book, really analyzing the chapters, the nouns that she used the most. And remember what I was doing for Ada. So in this case, I built my inspiration around more organic shapes, uh, really visual metaphors that could talk about the very nature of what she was talking about and about the body of her work. And uh, then these are some of the first sketches where every element could be a chapter of Rachel's book. And here I'll, I'll, I'll show you how I build the pattern from the ground up. So every radial element is one of the 17 chapters of Rachel's book. And the lines that you see are the number of paragraphs and their length. So nothing really complicated. The length, if it was like a short or long paragraph or medium. And on the left per each chapter, there's an aggregation of core structural elements, such as number of words, punctuation, and sentences. And building on top of it, I looked on the whole book to see what were the nouns and adjectives that she mentioned the most. So I'm just zooming in, chemical, insect here, bird, insecticide, control, DDT, but also same, young, long, small, human, little, natural, really um, depicting and, and, and pointing out what she was actually talking about. And then I looked into how much they have been mentioned per each chapter. And this is a final pattern with the long, the lengths of the different colored line representing how much she actually talked about a specific concept uh, in the book. Different background colors. Uh, these were the final silhouettes that we designed. And you know, you get the point, placing patterns in different ways on the fabrics as I did with Ada getting bolder with the sweater. Um, this was supposed to be a long uh, wetsuit. Now it became a body. Um, and uh, and yes, this is, this is, these are the final elements. And if you compare these with Ada's um, uh, clothing and pieces, you see that again, I mean, it's really recognizable that these are the same pattern. These are the same, speaking about the same data. But again, because we're talking about clothing, we uh, also gave ourselves the freedom to, uh, to place them in more creative ways. These are a sample in the details of the embroideries. I was, you know, kind of super pleased with the results. Uh, and Nikita wearing them for the shooting. You also can notice how she and I will never ever be like close by standing uh, up because she's like the tallest person I've ever seen and I'm probably the shortest one. So they also did a good job with the letter and, uh, and that. 
Um, so finally, Mae Jamison, uh, born in 1967 and still alive, she has been the first African American woman astronaut. And so, wait, yes, for her, I visualized the orbits of her space shuttle mission that happened in 1992. And in this case, visual mood board for me, taking visual inspiration from circular patterns, recalling orbits and recalling the imaginary that for me was around, you know, um, some sort of like uh, orbits uh, around Earth. I was starting to sketch the orbits possible feature and think at this point to really see that, you know, with the data in my mind, with the inspiration mods, then you start really to have this data coming alive through sketches. And at least this is always, always my process. I finally landed on this version where one circle is one orbit. Uh, we will have 126 of them. And this is the final pattern where the symbols above, so the little dot, the dashes, uh, and the different, uh, you know, again, symbols to represent which day she orbited around Earth in September 1992. This is a legend. And the colored shadows that you see right uh, uh, below the symbols represent the time of the day for the orbit. So it is really a simple data set that I built because I actually ultimately wanted to build a homage to her mission and on the color of the sky and on Earth as she saw it from above. And then on the background, the elements that you see are um, all of the experiments that she performed in nine in the nine days. So from red transmissions to zero gravity investigation. So this is uh, this is the simple data set that I built and visualized for myself. And then again, elements of the collection as we thought of them initially, possible placements um the shirt uh and then they are so once more i think you see how the pattern gets built and it forms some sort of like cohesive and coherent visual but then at the same time again uh you can get a little creative with the placement uh well there's an extra puffer for the winter and this is fun because when you light it up at night then the pattern gets visible so right now you only have the silhouettes um of it and Nikita wearing them, even one on top of the other. Uh, and then again, just to, to share you how the design of the whole collection went, after we had these like three buckets of pieces, we decided for each woman to also design a t-shirt, a very, very non-expensive t-shirt where we extracted only one element of the pattern as a bold signature, and some sort of also as a, as a cover piece to all of the others. And finally, when customers bought any of the garments in store, they got a paper bag um, that I designed containing the whole patterns and so here you see all the pattern displayed and the legend how to interpret what is in the texture which again for me is always a crucial point of my work and I'm smiling because I know that probably not everybody will nerd out dissecting other Ada's algorithm in their dress from here but at least really they know that what they're wearing has a deep meaning and you know, what excites me about these projects and why I wanted to conclude with it is that to me is another step further to demystify data. Like, for example, I see this specific project as one of the possible evolutions to the graphic t-shirts with a written message. And in this case, the fabric itself becomes the message where every feature of a garment can be deeply connected to information and messages that we are proud and happy to carry around with us. And if you think about it this way, well, there's infinite possibilities to create graphics on products, on things that we wear, on things that we see that can also communicate something that either us or the brand and uh, deeply care about. And the reason why I'm also particularly interested in these less conventional but perhaps more popular projects with data is their potential to reach a far wider audience that might start thinking about data in a different way. And again, I think that this opens up the opportunity to discover and reveal the human side of data, which is of course what uh, the one that matters the most. And yeah, this is the very, very conclusion. Um, over the years, I build my approach and practice around what I call data humanism, which to me means always to design ways to connect numbers to what they really stand for, which are our lives, our ideas, our unexplored and open questions about ourselves and our society. And then through design, making this new knowledge available for everybody to access and to engage with. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still very excited about all the possibilities opened up by this way of looking at data in this moment in time um, and I hope that you are excited too so I guess this is uh, it for me and I'll figure out a way to stop sharing right now that there's an ambulance of course uh, in New York
Thank you so much, Georgia. Uh, I was so excited to see your recent work with the garment data. That's so exciting. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> so I'd like to open it up now. We have some students uh, joining us to ask questions. So I'd like to open up the questions. Um, Shatakshi, would you like to begin? Yeah, um, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Uh, it was really inspiring. So my name is Shatakshi and I'm a first year MFA graphic design student. Um, so I was wondering that if you could talk a little bit about how do you strike balance between data and design in your work? Like for example, your Dear Data project, thinking about the amount of information you want to visualize without making it you know, too confusing for people to look at it and um, understand and designing it in a way that does not kind of take away the essence from the data. I was wondering if you could elaborate more on it. And sure. Talking. Well, thank you for the question. I think, you know, every case and every project is a little different. Every time I think you can really, you really need to ask yourself, what is the main important thing here that I need to make sure that comes across? So for example, in any of the Dear Data Postcard, um, every time the entry point for me as a designer was to understand, how do I tell the story? Do I tell the story through time? through grouping of my logs, through a geographical aspect? Is it a ranking? So the first thing is to me building what I call the architecture of the visualization. So is it a timeline? Is it a grouping of categories? Is it a ranking? And that is the entry point because as a human eyes, as readers, this is what we perceived first, where things are positioned. Then you know that the second element that is imp as important and you know, there are two elements that then are really important that are type of shapes and colors. And so you start to understand that the main symbols that you see mean, is it a circle I'm simplifying? Or is it a triangle? Or is it something more elaborated? And their color is the further element that you have to explain your categories. Everything else then is in the background tiny little dots to indicate a duration or a shadow to indicate, you know, the feeling. So it's all about visually building hierarchies and layers for you to, as a designer to display the information. Then over time, I think this process becomes intuitive. You don't think so much about, oh, okay, here's the architecture and then there's a symbol, but it's really about layers of clarity. And, you know, I think I tend to try and add a lot of details in the visualizations that I create because I think that uh, our world is complex, is multifaceted, and we need, if we can, to embed as much as possible, but also there are ways to do it in a more simple way. I also always say that one thing is designing a postcard for a person to really read as she drinks a coffee at home, and another thing is designing for a pilot who needs to land a plane. You know, you don't really get to elaborate with the flowers, you do like green and red, you know, but there's a full spectrum in between that I think one needs to strike every time, asking yourself about the audience uh, and how much time will they have to interpret your design. I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, so I'm, my name is Blake Thresher and I'm an MFA student as well in graphic design, second year. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I was curious about is like how you begin a project. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned a little bit about like with the um, in the is fashion modern, like starting from the end and working backwards. But then in your in your work with the textiles, it seemed like you started much like looking at the data more at the beginning. So I was just curious how you approach that. Yeah, that's such an interesting question, Blake. Thank you. So uh, I guess that every time it depends. To elaborate a little more on the fashion project, well, before starting on looking for the data, I, we needed to understand together with uh, the team um, and in other stories, what are the stories that we need to talk about? And so they approached me by saying, we would like this collection to be inspiring and aspirational and empowering for young women to just make them know that they can, you know, they can actually aim high. So that was like the broader brief. And so I decided then to look for data again in the achievement of women who actually paved the ground for other women. And so again, the very decision in the beginning was not already to go and look for the data, but like, what are the stories that I need to put together in this collection to make sure that the message that the clients want to give is actually, you know, can pass. And in the beginning, I thought, for example, to say, maybe I can visualize the 100 women that in the past century have accomplished something extraordinary. But then I decided, no, people need to re 
relate. And so I decided to propose stories of three women where we could go in depth in actually what they did. And so as opposed, for example, in this case to say a hundred, I decided for these three, these three together sort of like form a, a beautiful, um, I would say overview on science in three specific uh, places, which is again, technology and computer, uh, environment and discovery. So I, I, I think that this to me was the beginning of this project, thinking about the overall goal and what can be a content that is successful. Um, I guess to, to sort of like to give you a more general answer, to me, every time is about what are the stories that we need to tell. And for the MoMA, the reason why I said that I started backward is because I asked myself, what is valuable for the visitors? to see. And to me, what was valuable is understanding why is each item included in the show and what is that I might want to know about these elements without necessarily reading the pile of paper that I had the pleasure to read, right? So I guess in the beginning is always like asking yourself questions about the success of the project uh, for your audience, even before you go and look for data. And then of course, there's the looking for data that are there or crafting data sets. And then there's a the design process. Um, hi, Georgia. Thank you so much for the talk. I think it was really interesting. Um, I had a question um, that was um, a little bit more about like, I'm just curious about how I know that your work as a data visualization uh, designer doesn't necessarily fit into a specific, into, you know, into a clear graphic design job realm and i was just wondering how you started working and like um and how you know you started doing this kind of work and started getting known for this kind of work and what kind of approach you had after you kind of graduated or after being a student yeah uh, yeah well, I think this is interesting because I, I didn't study graphic design. I'm an architect. I have a master in architecture and I studied like five years of architecture back then, almost 20 years ago in Italy. Um, you, you didn't even have bachelors and masters. I could only be like five years. And so I studied architecture and to me, architecture, again, I always say that in retrospect, it was the way to merge. Um, my passion and need for numbers and structure and scientificity and organization with the need also to like build and create because ultimately, you know, in any case, composing a floor plan for a building and creating architecture is some sort of like a creative process. So this is why I decided. I think that right after I experimented with how, for example, um, so because during my studies, I was really fascinated by urban mapping, which in and of itself is already a form of information design. And right after I started just even with personal projects and things that I would do on the side to experiment in how actually to build maps that are not only maps about geography, maps about time, maps about things that I found. So I think for me, it was a passion that then I translated into some sort of like completely self-initiated projects. I taught myself how to use Photoshop Illustrators. I just really didn't know how to. Um, and uh, and after that, I started to look for opportunities in a field that could be closer to information design. I don't believe that there's one unique pattern. I think it's about exploring, experimenting, being open, especially when you're young and just graduated, make mistakes, learn what you like and what you don't like, do a lot of work, make, make self-initiated work, uh, figure out who you look up to and try to reach out to them. I think there's not really a one unique path, but um, I would just like really say that it's an incredible moment right now, especially like coming out of this pandemic to be graduating and starting to approach a world that is changing changed so much they probably don't even have uh doesn't even have rules anymore like the one that we um that we remembered and said so to me is all about being open being passionate trying and uh and remembering that you don't have to have it all figured out right now that's the thing that if i could say one thing to like my 23 years old self i would totally i would totally do thank you Hi, Georgia. Um, I'm Christy. I'm a senior in graphic design. Um, really quickly, I'm a super big fan of you for quite a while now, so I'm super excited to get to talk to you. Um, okay, so my question is, as someone who is really reinventing your field and doing things in a way that a lot of people haven't done before, 
Um, curious what your strategy is on being so innovative when you don't have a lot to, you know, look in the past for. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I think that it's not that it's my strategy, but what I know that I want to do and what is success for me is doing something that I have not done before. So I really try to not repeat myself. I mean, of course I have a style and I have a process and I have a method and probably you can recognize the thing that I do. So it's not about every time reinventing the wheel, but every time really trying to um, push, push my comfort zone, uh, try to experiment with other materials, with other scales, with other type of projects. And I think that, you know, there are designers that say they work with data visualization, that they only do editorial, they only do newspapers, and maybe they become so expert and so well known and so recognized for that. And I think the way that I approach this is, I want to design for a newspaper, for an exhibition, for a fashion collection, for medical health, for, um, you know, the Gates Foundation, for, you know, very different audiences. And I think that for me, that's what keeps what I do fresh. And every time working with a different client, uh, you're also, you also have the possibility to get completely immersed in their field. And working with a different data content, to me, is every time is what pushes things forward as opposed to only keeping doing graphic design that doesn't necessarily have a content to display. So in a way, to me, it is the data that will bring the innovation further every time. Uh, well, then I don't know, Christy, I don't necessarily think that I'm reinventing the field. I think I'm doing what I can do best. Um, but I think, you know, again, it's also about keeping being curious. If you're curious and you want to explore more, that will bring you to do things that you have not done before in life. And so, yes, it's safe sometimes to say, oh, I've done this poster that way. Maybe I can replicate it. And it, sometimes it works. It's not that you need to reinvent things every day. But some other times just being, all right, start from scratch. I've never done this. Let's try. It's, I think, what keeps you pushing forward. All right. Thank you so much. Again, thanks for being here. Hi, Georgia. Um, my name is Emily. I'm also a senior at Penn State Graphic Design. Um, my question was, um, as students were often pushed to pursue um, individual projects that lay outside a uh, client or classwork. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what you gained through your own passion project, Dear Data, um, and how this experience was different from client-based work. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think that every, uh, well, thank you for the question. Every self-initiated project is something that gives you an opportunity to explore something that you're curious about. In that moment in time, I was really curious about exploring on myself, exploring myself personally, getting to know this person and exploring on how we can remove technology completely from data and still making it meaningful, making it, um, you know, in a way understandable, but also I was also intrigued. Again, these are things that I wanted to explore, how can we make it, you know, relatable? Like, how can my mom be interested in what I do in a way? And so I think that starting from these questions, then, you know, you sort of like create a brief for yourself. So a project brief for yourself. And every time I think that helps you again, really explore something that you are curious about, then I think it really helps to have something or somebody that holds you accountable. In my case, it was Stephanie, like another person that I needed to, you know, collaborate with. Some other times is actually giving yourself deadlines that you share with somebody, say, you know, you'll post on Instagram, working on this personal project, I'm going to be publishing something on June 1st, I don't know, or like connecting with a journalist and saying, hey, I'm going to send you something about this personal project that I'm doing uh, May 15th. So that also helps you keeping uh, yourself accountable. I think in general for me, all of the self-initiated projects that I've done over the years then will help me um, reconnect to the nature of data and having more, I would even say, knowledge and information when I work on clients project. And I think that, you know, there's a space for making, there's a space for making without external boundaries, which can be scary, but if you start doing it, and also if you do it for the pleasure of making and doing it, as opposed to like, you know, oh, I need to achieve that goal, I think that that is where, um, you know, the most beautiful outcomes um, come out. Thank you. That was so insightful. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carly. I'm also a senior in the graphic design um, major. Hi, Carly. <laughs> uh, my question for you is, when you're looking at data, um, how do you best handle outliers and data that doesn't really follow 
what the rest of your research has shown? I mean, this is an interesting question. Again, it depends on the goal. Again, if you're working for the United Nations and you need to visualize global trends on countries, well, the outliers have really a specific, um, I would say, meaning and importance, and you need to highlight them in a way that make people understand that that's the bulk of a data set and that is an outlier and why. If you're working on personal data, I think that you can explain the outliers more than anybody else. If you're looking on qualitative data that you collected from an exhibition, well, you know, then you speak to the curator and you understand why. So to me, if you have what what you can call an outlier, first of all, is understanding what is it, what does it tell us about the whole data set, how important it is to actually uh, display it to show that it is an outlier or how much, and this is again a curatorial journalistic approach, how much we need to focus on the bulk of the story and the outliers is somehow an exception. And I think that this might sound like manipulating the data, but it is not, because in any case, every visualization of data is authorial, is journalistic, there's always an interpretation. You just need to make sure that every time then you um, provide readers or users or whoever are the final, again, recipient, the key to understand what you did. So if, for example, you're putting an outlier, depicting it in a zoom outside of visualization because it was too far up, just explain that you did it and why, uh, as opposed to having the outlier being at the center and having everything kind of like piled down because it is just too high. It's about the story that you want to tell all the time. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, hopefully we have time for just one question from the chat. So... I'm um, just reading here. Um, so one of the questions is, since sometimes you need to use technology like programming or algorithms to represent data, how relevant is it to know these technologies and programming languages? Do you have firsthand knowledge of this or is that something that is uh, brought to uh, your team by a particular person with that knowledge? Yeah, that's, that's again, it's a great question. I am really lucky because, I mean, I am a designer. I'm not a programmer. I'm not a statistician. I'm really lucky because I've always been able to work with uh, data scientists, statisticians, programmers, and I do still do it. So I have in my team people who can actually manage the technology in the best way. But I think for a designer, it's absolutely important to know what is possible to do, how the process of building an algorithm and developing a software or data visualization interactively works. What can you do in terms of analyzing a data set automatically? So really knowing what's possible, how long does it take? what you can expect is absolutely important. So I would not necessarily recommend designers to become programmer unless they're really intrigued about that, but really to be able to know what are the other specialties and skills involved and how can you collaborate at best with them is absolutely important. So I would say a a little over a basic knowledge, a little more than a basic knowledge is what uh, I say that everybody should do because otherwise you really just don't know what to ask to your collaborators and what you can expect. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone who asked questions and joined us today. Uh, thank you so much, Georgia, for, for all of this wonderful presentation. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. And I highly recommend going to Georgia's website and following up there, she has a lot more amazing projects and, and there's a lot on her on her website that you can uh, learn from. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Emily. Thank you everybody for having me and uh, happy weekend, everybody. Bye, bye, bye. Bye.